Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. So, hi. Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Mark Sorota. I'm a member of the school board. I'm the chairman of the operations committee, and I'm also chairing the whole Sandy Run development process. Um, what we have tonight is a presentation from our architects, Rob and Glenn Breslin, who are right here. Um, I'll do the first slide and then hand it off to them. They'll talk to you about how we got to where we are, where we are in the process, what's left to come. And then once that presentation is done, that'll take about maybe half an hour. Um, then we will open it up for questions. And so uh, when we get to that phase, those of us who want to listen to you, we'll turn around and go up here so we can hear and see you. Uh, and we uh, invite you to come up and, and uh, make comments, ask questions, etc. When we get to that phase, I'll, I'll issue this reminder again, but we're here mostly to talk with the architects about the design. Um, this isn't the right meeting to talk about should we do it at all or the budget or any of that kind of thing. We're, we're talking about design in this phase of the, of the process. Yeah, why don't you go to the first slide? So as we've gotten here, I just want to uh, say we've been guided by these principles. Uh, of course, the most important is the educational program for middle level learners that drives everything. Uh, it's a community asset for 50 years. Our target is that this is a uh, building that should last and serve us well for 50 years. So it's, it's a long-term decision we're making here. The decisions are driven much more by what will this do for us for the whole community of Upper Dublin for 50 years than it is for the next year or two during the construction process. We're looking for a practical, flexible building design, which goes well with trying to make it last for 50 years. We have no idea what education will look like then. We want an energy efficient, maintainable facility. It's not efficiency just about energy, but efficiency about staff requirements and all those kinds of things. Uh, an efficient site solution to reduce cost. As you know, it's a difficult site. It slopes heavily. There's a floodplain covering a large portion of the bottom of the site. Um, and we want to use the best of the site, play to its strengths, try to work around its weaknesses. Uh, the temporary phasing, we want to minimize educational impact during the process, but again, that's a secondary concern to the final product. Quality construction, of course, and, and we are always tightly uh, focused on budget and schedule. So from here, I'm going to hand it over to Robin Breslin. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to point out to everybody, if you picked up a handout of the floor plans on your way in, what we're showing on those floor plans is the main level. We're showing the site plan, and then we're showing the main level floor plan. Sorry. So we have the site plan there and the main level floor plan. What we don't have is the upper level classroom and the lower level classroom plan because we don't have them. We don't have them totally worked out yet, but they're very close to the plan that you see on the main level. A lot of it is repeat uh, classrooms, just a couple of change out. So what I wanted to talk about for the first part of the presentation is the site utilization. And the first thing that we want to do is talk about the site access. We have Twining Road down here, and then we have Lime Kiln Pike up here. The annex is located here, and the middle school is located here. Sandy Run Creek is here. The, the main entrance road and bridge are here. And the floodplain is basically represented by this dark green area, basically right all along here, on either side of the creek. Next. We do not believe that, that new driveway access is feasible from Twining Road or from Lime Kiln Pike because of the sight lines to the intersection. So we just don't believe that we're going to be able to put in a new entrance road off, off those main streets. We also acknowledge the fact that there is an existing entrance road off Twining Road and there's an existing bridge going across the creek that, that the school district has invested infrastructure into. So we'd like to take advantage of that. The other part of this is that we have limited access from Autobahn, and we're talking that through right now. We want to have two means of egress to this site for emergency vehicles, but we may want to restrict some of the access from Autobahn Drive. Next slide, please. 
The next slide is going to talk about the topography of the site. And the site slopes from the high point up here at the top down to basically what we call the riparian buffer, which is the floodplain. We're not allowed to build in the floodplain. We can keep existing fields like this baseball field. We can keep that in the floodplain where it is. But what we don't want to do is build new infrastructure into that floodplain, have it flood, and then have it be grown. The other part is that the site slopes down at different rates. On this side, it's the steepest part of the site. It slopes from 28 feet from the back of the driveway here down to the floodplain. The middle part of the site slopes 21 feet because the, it, the middle drops a little bit right, right here. It's a little bit lower back there. And on this side of the site is the most gradual slopes. It's 27 feet over a much longer distance. So that's ideal for development of parking areas and play fields. Next slide. With regard to the site identity, we believe that the site identity of the existing schools is rather poor right now. I'll try to speak louder. So what this slide shows is that we believe that we have four identity from Twining Road and Landfill Pike. When you when you drive by right here in a car and you're looking up, you're looking at the back of this building and the back of this building. You don't see really where the parking lots are, you can't see where the entrances are. If you're really smart, you'll go to the bike holes because that will help you get to the main entrance of the site. The other part about this is that the parking is, is this pair. You have one lot here, you have another lot here. So as you're driving into the site, you don't really know where you're going to go park to get to the front door as you arrive for the first time. So again, there's no sense of real entrance to the site. We'd like to improve that. With regard to the site development, good. Thanks. Two options. This one. No, I I fixed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So one of, the, one of the things that, that the school district uh, decided early on the design process was that the annex building will come down as part of the first phase of the construction. We originally were going to try to design between the two buildings and then take the existing buildings down and then finish the construction. With that decision made, that will put modular classrooms up to support the middle school and get rid of the annex. That opens up then a nice big building pad at that area of the site. Next slide. It would make sense, it would seem to make sense to keep the play fields down here in the flood zone where they are now if we have them grandfathered in and they're existing. We also would like to distribute some at other locations too, particularly up here where it's out of the floodplain if we want to do something uh, with a nice field, perhaps a synthetic field. And then what we'd also like to do is then distribute the parking. The main parking lot would be here to serve the building, the auditorium, the gym, etc. But we'd also have distributed parking that would serve the play fields. Uh, after hours. Next slide. With regard to the existing uh, neighborhood, we have the Manufacturers Golf and Country Club going up the hill on the side of the site, and we have the Lulu Country Club over here on Twining Road. But we also have a neighborhood that the existing buildings are quite close to now. We want to be aware of our proximity to the neighbors, and we want to be a good neighbor. So we'd like to put the quiet side of the new school towards the neighborhood. Next. We also feel that the desirable, desirable views are down towards Sandy Run Creek and towards the wooded area <coughs> and over towards the Manufacturers Country Club. The views out this way aren't so great. There's some commercial buildings that are over here. But actually, as you drive by down the line, come back and look back in this way, there are strong view lines into the new building. Next. With regard to the solar path of the sun, it rises in the and it sets in the west, so you pretty much have south sunlight on this side of the building all day long. That is ideal, next slide. If you were in your new building with an east-west axis running, running in that direction, because it's the most energy efficient. The sun is always on the one side of the building, and the other side of the building is could be in uh, heating or cooling mode, but it's not affected by the south sun. Next slide. So again, if you take our, our concepts and if we build the modular classrooms in the summer of 2019 and demolish the annex, we'll open up that building pad. 
and this is where probably the modulars would go. We're still working on that. Next slide. Just to give you a summary of where we be began the design, uh, this goes back to our original option that we presented at the interview. This was option one. When we started designing this option, we were under under the directive from the school district that the annex would remain over here. So we were trying to design a building that fit in between the two buildings. And then later when you knock down the annex, we would continue, complete the rest of the construction, which would be the gymnasium. But with the modulars added, now we can build this all at once. So this is, this is how that building would sit relative to the existing middle school. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how the site would be developed. You have a lower parking lot here with a parental drop off and an entrance on the ground floor. You have an upper lot up here where the bus loading occurs and the buses would have an entrance. The bus uh, riders would have their own entrance on the floor above the, the lower floor. The entrance down here would be up here. We we're also thinking of putting a planetarium right there too so that it would be in and out. So you have basically the common use facilities here on two floors and then you have a three-story classroom wing here and here surrounded about a courtyard. But these ran north-south, so they weren't ideal from a lead standpoint. Then we went to option two, which we also presented at the interview, and we said basically if the annex went down first, then we could build a new school here with the existing school remaining with the modulars, and we just have to stay away from the existing footprint to be able to construct a new building. This building had a concept where you built all the common use facilities, the cafeteria, the auditorium, gymnasiums, etc., all on one side. And then you step, as the slope sto slopes down the hill, you step out a three-story classroom with big, excuse me, a three-story classroom wing that you enter on the middle floor and either go up a floor or go down a floor to reach the three floors. What we didn't care for on this scheme was the fact that this was a really long walk from here all the way over to here. And you could cross here or you could cross here, but it's still quite a long walk. Next scheme, please, or next uh, iteration. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, this scheme, sh this slide shows you how it would be developed, how the rest of the site would be developed when the existing building came down. On uh, this slide, what we're talking about is the things that we like about with option two. We like the desirable views. We think that, think that it takes advantage of it. We think it takes advantage of the solar path laying out the building in an east-west axis. And if you compare our original option two, which is over here, to what became option three, when we sat down with the school district and talked about what we like about option one and what we like about option two, that's how we developed option three. And option three and option two both retain a courtyard here and here. But the difference is we took all of this space and we kind of crunched it down. It's still all here, but it's now a, a, a thicker building in the north-south direction. But you still have the three-story classroom wing over here, but now it's not nearly as far to go from this end of the building to this end of the building. This slide shows fields and parking. The existing conditions are on the left, the proposed conditions on the right. You have three baseball fields, one softball field, a multi-purpose field, a football field, and a basketball court. There's also 103 dedicated full-time spaces on the existing lot, 183. On the new proposed lot, we're looking at one baseball field, one softball, one multi-purpose, one football, one soccer, and one basketball court. On this scheme, we had 230 dedicated full-time spaces. Then in addition to that, where the buses would park in this Chevron uh, diagram here, you could have an additional 70 overflow spaces for after hours. So this was the floor plan for option one, and again, you can kind of see how long of a travel distance you would have to go to get over to the auxiliary gym. Next slide. Here's the floor plan for option three as we were developing it. We added another corridor here. We put the music area back here along with the planetarium. We have the shipping and receiving loading dock here. The kitchen, boiler room, cafeteria is here. Over here would be the main gym the auxiliary gym, the locker rooms. You'd have administration and guidance right around the main entrance from the front uh, parking or bus drop-off area. And then as you came out into the three-story classroom wing, you'd have the library. As you came across this hallway here, you'd have a big window on the middle level floor that would look down towards Sandy Creek. It'd be a very impressive window. 
and we are suggesting a little collaborative area right outside that, uh, right inside the window. On this scheme, we were looking at splitting up the groups, the teams. You'd have some of the teams would be over here, and some of the teams would be over here, and then the common use facilities would be in between, such as, for example, art and science laboratories. There's a main stair here and a main stair here that allows you to go come across the hallways and go up or down the floor. So it's it's quite compact and quite efficient. The other stairs are simply fire stairs that are required uh, by exits. But there's only four stairs stairs in this scheme. Right now we have one elevator, but we're looking at a second elevator for redundancy purposes. Next scheme. This was a, a scheme where we further developed it. One of the things that we didn't care for is that the loading dock faced out to the neighbor's backyards. And what we wanted to do was create a wall and a courtyard so that the loading dock was now accessed from this direction for trucks coming in and out and then leaving. That contains a lot of the sounds and, and equipment, emergency generators, things like that within that courtyard, completely walled off. When you look at the building from this side, you wouldn't even know that this is open space here would look like it's just the building school. So we contain all of those functions in that courtyard. The other thing we started looking at in this scheme was possibly some type of a paved jogging track or walking track, uh, but we since moved on. Next slide. 3B is kind of very close to where we're at right now, although this is constantly in flux. We're always looking at cutting square and moving some drones around. But we're getting very close to the final footprint that we have all the right pieces in the right place. Um, if, if, if the school district approves this. Essentially what we were looking at in the classroom wing here is we wanted to put, combine all the teams into this wing of the classroom, leave these common use facilities like science labs and maybe some of the classrooms that are used by all three grades over here so that students could come in to get into this wing and right back out. They don't have to go down into this wing. So if you segregate the building by six graders on one floor, seven on another, and eight on another, this helps segregate them even further so that you're not walking into those zones. Next slide. Uh, here is the site plan. And one of the things, one of the questions that has been asked is where will the center the site? And what we'd like to do is get all, if not all, very close to all the buses coming in this direction. They would come up like this pull in here, line up like that. When they go to leave, they would pull forward and go back out onto Twining Road. Same thing with truck deliveries. If, it, if it, we had to get a service truck in here, we would not want them coming through here. We would want them coming in like this, come around, and then back in, and then exit back out onto Twining Road. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, could you, can you go? Oh, no, this is okay, this is okay, it shows it. On this slide, one of the things that we did is a small thing, but we, we manipulated where this road goes to get it closer to the property line to widen out this area here so that we could get a better field. So what this is showing right now is a regulation soccer field and a regulation football field in the same location. I'm sorry, a multi-purpose field, not a, I don't think we have a football field anymore, do we? We do, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, but the idea was, since this is out of the flood zone, this could be a synthetic field. And that obviously would hold up much better uh, to wear, wear and tear on the, on the grass. Next slide. So, if you go back to our diagram that we suggested before, right here is where we showed the possible building pad, the play fields, and then the park. So, we kind of had it worked out according to the diagram that we started with. Next slide. We feel this is an interesting slide for people because it shows you the relative distances. The black is the existing middle school and annex superimposed on the site plan for the new school. And if you went from one side of Sandy Run to the other side of the annex, it would be 1,076 feet. The way the crow flies, not walking through the cars, it would be long. That's a pretty long distance for a school. Uh, if you went the same distance in our new school from one end to the other end, it would be 522 feet. Additionally, we looked at from this classroom, how long would it be to get to the auxiliary gym, and it's about 566 feet. Uh, football field, for relative purposes, is 360 feet from the end of the end zone to the end of the other end zone. So you can see our building's getting much more compact as we've been designing. 
Next slide. If you compare the footprints of each building side by side, you have the proposed on this side and then the existing over here. The roof area is remarkably the same, about 148,000 square feet. But the building area, we're targeting about 212,000 for the new, and the existing building is 178,000 square feet. So you can see that the layout of this building has a much smaller footprint and will allow for much more site development than the existing building does because it's much more efficiently designed. This is, this is the most current floor plan where you know, we flip the dock around, we we're looking at putting the planetarium here, surrounded by coral, orchestra, band. There's a fitness center here, there's a, a health classroom here and some storage, auxiliary gym, locker rooms, gymnasium, guidance, administration. There's gang toilets here and gang toilets over here. So if you were to open this up for functions in the auditorium or the, or the gymnasium, you'd have support of the, of the toilets. Then in addition to that, we have the nurse, we have the stage and auditorium. The auditorium seats, how many going to? 480 currently. And uh, then of course we have the food court and the cafeteria. The idea is that the cafeteria, you could go outside and maybe there would be like a pergola or a trellis at this location and some outdoor tables uh, underneath it. This main axis extends out to the intersection at Lime Kiln and Twining Road, so walkers can come right in and come in the building in this, on this side. We have the uh, basketball court here. This is another potential multi-purpose field with parking next to it. And then in the floor plan out here, as I was mentioning before, we have the common use classrooms here, but the beams are, are over here. We have a small group room here that we've developed and we made the collaboration space smaller. We also have an area of collaboration space over here in the hallway so that the student had to go out and do a makeup test they could do it at this location. Next slide. This just blows up the area that I was talking about to show you some of the features of the auditorium. Uh, it could have a light lock here so that when somebody goes opens the doors during the presentation, it doesn't bring a lot of light in from the corridor. The stage would be an accessible stage. We have a wheelchair lift to get you up to it. If we can design the stage floor to be at the same height as the as the corridor floors, then a, this entire side of the building, including the middle uh, wing of the classroom floor, is all on one level, with the exception of the pit in front of the stage. That would be the only place where we would like to divert from that. The lobby was designed to be large enough to have large crowds coming out of intermission, intermission or a half time. There's some benches and things like that. We have a school store down near the cafeteria and a concession stands over here near this main lobby area where you answer. Next slide. And again, as you come across the classroom wing, you come past the library first. There's that big window that looks down towards the creek. You get the teams, the common use facility, and the science classrooms. And then you have another set of gang toilets that stacks on all three floors of the classroom. And two elevators in the scheme. We had the original one here, and we were looking at adding another one down here at this corner. Next slide. The upper floor, if you came up the stair tower and came into this floor, you we fill in the spaces where the bridges were, with storage, and there's a guidance, or sorry, an assistant principal, I believe, office over here. There's a long storage room here, there's a room for a mechanical room here that would serve the library. Um, and I think that's, that instead of having uh, science classrooms here, I'm sorry, computer, I think it's computer, right? Computer on the middle floor. On the upper floor, we now are suggesting family consumer science. And on the ground floor, which would be the next one, we would we'd suggest the art classrooms because they've asked to be able to take their stuff outside and go outside to have art class. So those are the three floors of the classroom wing. Uh, this happens to be a section across the site. The neighborhood is up here by Audubon. There's the property line. Here's Sandy Run Creek over here. Here's the property line at Twining Road. If you took a section through the building here, you can see the, the site slope. There's a, go to the next slide, please. There's a, there's a dashed line here, a red line. That's the existing grade as it comes down. So you can see by sticking our classroom wing away from the one-story portion of the building, we can utilize the grade to go down the floor and then to simply connect across on the middle 
level. So this middle level is all one level with the exception of the auditorium floor. Back here you're seeing the planetarium, the orchestra room, the, the hallway, the stage, auditorium, the connected corridor over to the three-story classroom. And, and just to kind of bring you up to speed on what's been happening since we were hired as the architect, as we've toured two buildings, we've toured the Nichman Middle School for the Bethlehem School District, and just last week we went over to the New Town Middle School for the Council Rock School District. That is under construction right now, but it's getting close to being occupiable. So we got a chance to look at those two brand new middle schools. And then we also have proposed workshops for the community. We have a meeting with the township this morning. We have, we'll have teachers' workshops and community workshops. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Arif. He's going to kind of talk about the schedule and what's next. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thanks. So I just wanted to give you guys some uh, target milestone schedules that we're following and uh, give you an idea of uh, where we're trying to head with the schedule. Oh, who am I? I'm Arif Fazil, I'm the project manager for the uh, project, and we'll be overseeing the design and construction phase of the project also. Thanks. So uh, the design phase, as I said, is underway, and the goal is to finish the design in uh, by February of next year, 2019. Uh, the purpose for that is so that we can do our bidding in February through April of next year, and then um, Land development approvals, we're looking at starting that towards the end of this month, um, as soon as we get the floor plan fixed, the schematic design, and uh, walk that through the various approvals through March of next year. The new construction would then begin in uh, next summer, in about May, and continue for about two years, at which time the transition would occur into the new building and then we would uh, complete the rest of the demolition and the site work for approximately another year worth of work uh, to do that. Uh, we do have some contingency options, thankfully, because the building is uh, going to be moving here. You know, there's some options if some of these dates slip due to approvals or design. You know, one of the things that I think we're committed to is making sure that the design is uh, as complete as possible and that we make sure we get the endorsement of all the stakeholders and the community, as well as, of course, making sure we have all our I's dotted and our T's crossed before we go out to bid. So, uh, you know, contingency plan could be to delay that a little bit uh, further if necessary, but right now this is what we're targeting to try to strive for uh, what we believe would be a efficient way to construct the building. So. Uh, Robin kind of covered the other step. The, the next step right now, we've been getting stakeholder input, including, of course, this meeting. And the goal here is to really make sure we have the building site you know, properly uh, uh, oriented, the uh, features in the right locations, and, of course, that the program um, has covered all the bases. So that's really what we're focused on, so that we can then begin the land development approval process. After this, there'll still be plenty of other community input, stakeholder input on the design development, which are the details of the plan. So today, um, we may not be able to answer all the details. The goal here is to really understand the concept of how the building is being laid out. Um, we can certainly try to answer as many questions as we can, but of course, there's a lot of work, as you can see from the timeline, uh, still to go. Um, I think the, the next step, obviously, as we continue, will be to constantly look at the budget, and uh, we will have a complete value engineering uh, uh, workshops to then further look at the cost options and how we can best engineer the building uh, to provide the best value. So that will be one of the focuses. And then, as I said, design development with some specific focus groups on the individual spaces, such as what happens within the auditorium, what happens within the planetarium. We started some of those discussions in the space planning, but those details will continue to be developed. So I think that's the presentation, Mark. So our, our plan from here um, is we will read the screen, and those of us um, who want to hear your input, which is our whole 
design team will sit up there and we'd invite you to come up and, and give us comments or ask us questions. Um, before we do that, so Greg, can you go back to a slide that shows the, the uh, courtyard, please? Because this is a, a thing in the design that, that people find confusing, and I thought maybe we could try to explain it. So the way this works is, and this is somewhat counterintuitive, which is why I want to call attention to it. The high side of the site is over here, the low side of the site is over here. The courtyard slopes, but it actually slopes. This is the high side of the courtyard, and this is the low side of the courtyard. So here you can see there's doors out from the middle floor. So the top, the top of the courtyard, the left side, is at the height of the middle floor of the classroom wing. And then the this end of the courtyard, there's actually on the lower floor, there's doors right here out to the lower floor of the classroom. So this is steps down. Um, so to go down this way, this is an elevated corridor. So this, this side is elevated 14 feet approximately over the ground below. And this end is just at grade. This is just a hallway, not, a, not what you might call a bridge. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. The actual layout of the courtyard with these exact terraces and that kind of thing, just like the rest of the spaces, it looks very complete because the software makes it look very complete. Um, but the actual details of how this would be laid out and landscape, et cetera, is still to be determined, just like the actual layout of what goes in the rooms. But I just wanted to clarify that this does slope from left to right, not from top to bottom. All right. So from here, um, what we'll do is uh, we'll raise the screen. A bunch of us will go up to the table and listen. I'm going to put the microphone here in the stand. If anyone wants to come and ask questions or make comments, again, please focus on the design, not on other related issues. Um, we would invite you to come up and do that. If you think you might want to do that, we would invite you to come up and sort of sit near here or form a line so that we don't have to wait too much time. Yes? Yeah. Uh, the question was, do we have a slide that shows the elevation of the existing school and the new school? By elevation, do you mean oh, the height? Uh, I don't think we do. We haven't actually designed the elevations yet, or the residents haven't designed the elevations yet of the new proposed building. But do you have a, an estimate of that? Um, I think they're going to be both relatively about the same height. The highest height would probably be the stage roof on this scheme at about 34 to 36. And my guess is you probably, your gym, as, as it comes up out of the grade, is about 30 feet times the I'm more concerned with the annex relationship. Uh, right. so why don't we, um, not that I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, why don't we do that uh, after we, because then we'll be able to hear you and get that feedback now, right? Well, he's talking about the, uh, the auditorium. Yeah. yeah, the highest part of the annex is the classroom wing, um, which is two stories. Uh, above the main level of the annex, but um, I don't think we have, we don't have those numbers with us. No, I, I don't have those today. The, the problem is if you move the school towards the south, go into the flood zone very quickly. We're very close to it.
So the team we have coming up are the uh, internal design team for the project. Uh, myself is chairing it. We have Dr. Clark, who's the principal of the middle school. We'll have the architects up here. Bob Lester, who's working on the mic over there, is our director of facilities. We'll have Brenda Bray. There she is, who's our uh, business manager. And Arif, our project manager. And we're working on figuring out the microphone thing here. All right, thank you for your patience. Uh, just gonna... All right, sorry about that. So um, Dr. Clark is gonna take notes for us. Um, and um, I will point out the meeting is also being recorded. Uh, presumably I think that's gonna go on our YouTube channel. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, for your awareness. So the way this will work, if you'd like to speak, Teresa's already up here, uh, come on up. Um, try to keep your comments fairly short. If it goes too long, I may cut you off just to give other people a chance. Uh, and you know, you can come back around later to complete um, if, if that does happen. Uh, and uh, we'll try to answer each person's questions as we go. Um, so ask your questions, we'll try to answer them. Um, we can have a small amount of back and forth at the end. We want to make sure we give everyone a chance. Go ahead, Trey. Oh, and I'm sorry. Before, when you do come up to speak, please uh, state your name so we know who you are, um, what part of the township you're from, or uh, other relevant information for us, just so we know. Thanks. Sure, Teresa. Teresa, I have uh, St. Brown student and two Maple Gun students. I have three questions about the layout, but before I uh, say anything, just want to say thank you to all of you, to the board. Um, you guys worked really hard. Um, this committee's worked really hard, and I appreciate, we appreciate all the time and talent that you're pouring into this. It, it, it looks like a very positive floor, floor plan and a lot of good things. So, um, so I have three questions, but before I get to those, uh, actually about the budget, because I used to be an engineer. My my. Uh, Boss said, never come to a meeting without a schedule and a budget. So are we still at, because I heard 60 million first, now 70 million, hopefully not next month, 80 million. Are we still there with this option three or three A or whatever it is? Yeah, the budget hasn't changed. Um, we originally, when we reviewed this, we had three options, you may remember. We were talking about a renovation, knock down the annex and build an addition to this building and renovate this building, or third option, knock both down and build a new building. So we've decided on knock, knock it down and build a new building. The budget, uh, the highest of the options was 70 million. That's the number we've been using all the way through, and that's the number we're still at. Uh, that number was determined based on a simple square footage calculation, based on our educational program, approximately 208,000 square feet, worked out to 55 or 60, and I have a number in front of me, million dollars for the building plus land development contingencies, et cetera, works out to a total of 70. Okay. Uh, so my three questions, one was about the um, outdoor courtyard. I heard that some talk about it being a classroom space, which um, kind of like an outdoor hardscaping classroom space, which sounded nice. I guess there was some concern about security and enclosing that, that sounded um, expensive to me. Um, you know, obviously security is so important, but we have other, we have kids outside all the time, whether it's at gym or at recess or at lunch, 
at all the buildings, especially the elementary school. So I personally would say, please look at that money and can we be used somewhere else like CCTV cameras throughout the building and outside. And is that in the budget now? CCTV, you know, or whatever, cameras um, for security in this current plan? Yeah. Um, in the grand scheme of things, cameras are cheap compared to a $70 million project. Um, but yes, so the building would, I, it would, we haven't gotten into planning any of these details, but the expectation is it would have cameras inside and out. Um, we did, we have talked about, um, so last week this presentation was made to the board's operations committee, and a few board members did comment about security of the court yard because it is open on one side. Uh, and we are having, you know, it's, it could be closed off. Um, in the design where those conversations continue. But either way, closed off or not, I'm sure it would have cameras. Because okay. we, we had the same issue at all the schools with kids being outside. So, uh, second question was about, I guess a lot of, there was a lot of talk about like one space for all, like all school meetings and stuff like that. I assume that would be in the gym. I wasn't sure if it's even like an option to put like a small little stage where you could have like a mini, Kind of like the elementary schools have, they have that like small little sliver. Um, but I don't know if that would be too cost, you know, for, but for small assemblies, awards, or, or that kind of thing, um, sort of like for Washington. I'm not sure if it's worth it or not, but I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. you know, I, I think that there was some concern of the community, so I'm just bringing it to Yeah, uh, and I don't want to be the one with the only voice, but it seems like we have only one mic at the moment. Um, so as long as I have the answers, I'll try and give them, and then we'll pass it around when I get stumped. Um, it is the norm in schools that the largest space that you can collect people is in the gym, not necessarily in the auditorium. Uh, not all schools, even middle schools, even have auditoriums. Um, so our plan for the main gym is for seating for about for at least two grades, and the third grade would sit on the floor, and then there'd be room for presenter or whatever else uh, also on the floor. Um, you could, in theory, put risers on the floor. Bob gets a little fidgety whenever I talk about putting anything on the floor. Uh, Brenda's is getting fidgety too. Um, but yes, so uh, that's the that is the design. That's where. If you had to have a whole school concrete, it would be there. Also, I'm sure Dr. Clark gets fidgety whenever we're talking about putting the entire school all in one room in the first place, because 950 to 1,000 kids in one place um, is a lot of kids in one place. Uh, but if we had to, that would be where we would do it. Last question was about the planetarium. I guess the public um, perception was that that was going to be sort of presented as an ad, or at least the cost broken out, to whether that would be um, I'd like to still see that as as, a, as an option, so people know really what that cost is, because um, everything has a benefit cost analysis. Um, so we all love the planetarium, but is the value really there for the cost? And without knowing the cost, you can't make that determination. Um, you know, we can get. Emo I don't even like saying it, right? We can get emotional because we've had the planetarium, but is that really the best use of our of our money? considering that tech science and technology has changed, you know, as far as like a STEM lab, would the money be better spent in some sort of STEM lab? I, my understanding is like, was it Higgins doing this like fab fabrication, engineering and technology fabrication? You know, like, could the money be used in a different way for s science, technology, engineering, because that's really where the jobs are. That's really where we want to get kids excited about going into those fields. So, you know, I mean, I know the plan terms are mostly for elementary schools, but if you don't break the cost out, how can they really make a, you know, determination about the value of so. so there was a lot in there, I'll try. Um, and some of it was comment and some of it was question. So the, uh, <laughs> yes. the, <laughs> uh, the planetarium, as you saw, is in, the, is in the design. It's actually kind of in the middle of the building at the moment. It's not an easy, um, uh, alternate delete. We have talked about making an alternate delete at one point. We do still have to cut square footage out of the building to get down to budget. Um, uh, and it's not clear um, where, you know, we'll, we'll have to work on that. There are places outside of program space that can be cut as well. Things like hallways and mechanical rooms and utilities and, and places like that it doesn't all have to come out of program space. Um, there's also um, something roughly equivalent to was the Hickens Fab Lab. We have, we have a space adjacent to the library called the Project 
uh, sorry, the project-based learning studio, um, which is a library-based um, sort of student-driven, self-driven um, program where that kind of thing happens. It's very similar to what Mr. Higgins is talking about. And of course, our tech ed curriculum, tech ed and computing, um, is really a lot about fabrication as well. So um, we do have those spaces in the budget as well. It's not an either or necessarily. Um, I think uh, the majority of the board has informally expressed support for the planetarium. But you're right, we have to visit right. total right. cost. And if we take it with a million dollars, you know, what yeah. if it's So in terms of the rough cost, we can look at it as, uh, right now everything's calculated on square footage. Our current planetarium right across the hall there is a 30 foot, it's about 700 square feet from the planetarium itself. We're talking about a 40, within that plan is a 40 foot dome, which is about 1,250 square feet, out of a total of a 208,000 square foot building. It's not a huge, Oh, I, uh, I, I guess I didn't think cost. it was just about the square yeah. footage and a specialty type of a yeah. it's not, you know, it's not, it is probably an above average cost space, but so is a kitchen and an auditorium and a lot of other places and other things are below average cost, but, you know, so that part it's of a small value portion engineer? of the total cost. That, you know, when we get into value engineering, And who is yes. on the value engineering? Is there any of the public or is it just an internal kind of thing as far as the value engineering process? Arif, can you answer how that's normally handled? We haven't gotten yes. there yet. Yeah. So our uh, value engineering process incorporates um, obviously the architect, the mechanical engineer, and the site engineer. So basically the expertise of the people doing the design. There will be members of the um, school district. Um, I'm assuming Mark will represent the school district uh, board. So there will be a member of the board or two members of the board, depending if they can. Um, obviously the administrative team that's sitting here and uh, typically we do not include the public these are pretty intense day-long meetings and there's multiple meetings so what happens at the first one is we will send out um, basically a request for anybody will put together a set of documents the, where the plans are at that point and they'll include outline specifications they'll include plans They'll include budget information. They'll include as much information as we have. We may incorporate somebody from uh, an approval standpoint, like the township, because they're a very collaborative process between the township and the school district. There may be a township representative on that. Typically, we don't open it up to public and community, because as I said, it's a very intense, day-long thing. So what we request is that they send feedback, um, and we have a, a project manager assigned who receives all the feedback and that feedback is kept confidential so we want feedback from everybody and no idea is elim eliminated initially no idea wants to be um, you know finger pointed at we want kind of an open system any idea is open okay. so, we so get there is some sort of a, a, an opportunity and if you could just explain what is, how do you give that feedback like what is the so what happens is we get that feedback and then all of that is put into a list the team then that I outlined basically at a meeting will rank those okay and we'll say requires further evaluation should not be considered great idea and then the, the require further consideration great idea ones are transferred to an actual value engineering process where you actually look at the value you get so you know number one obviously part of the value decision is cost but it's also how you actually get value Okay, so it's not just about cost cutting. So no, I, I guess I was just asking, how, what is that process? Is it a survey you're sending out to, to people? Or how, what is the actual means to give you input? If people wanted to say they didn't want their planetary because they took it with a million dollars and they, I, I'm so, just asking you, so is there a way for that input? And yeah, they, that? they could say that. They could say, you know, reduce the size of the auditorium. Or let's not build. Is it a survey? Oh, no, they, they're going to send fill out a form and send it in and then these different ideas will be put into a sheet and then they'll be ranked. But we're not there yet. So we don't have, we not don't to have the public in the place yet. No, so, so we can't say that. I'm well, you're all, you're, you're, we're here to take input. You can say that at any time, but we will have, it sounds like a more formal process when we get to that phase of the process. Okay, I was just trying to clarify whether public was part of giving you input later on, but it sounds like no. no not, not on the value engineering, you can do that now. Uh, typically, the VE process is not about, okay, why you're building two science rooms. You know, so the VE process at that point is not 
based on program modifications necessarily. Now you can look at certain program components. For example, it could be why are there so many windows on in this elevation, uh, but not necessarily square foot adjustments. In, in whole, like in terms of deleting a program. Those are programmatic things that the educational specialist, the community needs to weigh in now, and it becomes part of the program. All right, let's move on to somebody else, Mike. Michael Klein, Maple Glen, and I'm president of the Upper Dublin Junior Athletic Association. Um, basically, I just wanted to uh, make some comments just on some of the field um, and gym space that I see. But I did want to say, I mean, I do like the basic design of the school because obviously the square the school is, the more efficient it is. Less kids have to travel from one end of the school to the other. So the basic footprint looks really good. Uh, I guess one of the questions I would have is I know we were concerned about security and closing off areas, especially in those areas that you know might be used after school hours. And it looks to me like basically it's this whole portion would be open, the planetarium, the gyms, the, it doesn't seem like there's really something they like to use the planetarium without having access to everything around it, the auditorium, the gym. The gym. So I don't, I don't know if that was a concern. Uh, Brother or Glenn, uh, is there a comment to make on that? Yes. Once, once we get all the pieces in the right place, you know, the auditorium's in the right place, the gym's in the right place, then we'll look at how can we utilize the building in pieces in after hours use. For example, we could put a rolling gate at the entrance of the bridge and the other place where you connect to the three-story classroom. We could completely close that side of the building off from the common use stuff. But within the common use areas, we want to look at how the school district would use it. Would it just be the gym and auxiliary gym? Would it be, could there be something in the auditorium at the same time? Even the cafeteria, we might want to know create some type of barriers that you can limit use to that but what we did was we located the gang toilets central on either side of the auditorium so that you could close one half of the school or the other half of the school and still have access to toilets okay. so we're, we're a little early on in that thought process but it is something that will complete we, we've given it some thought about the gates of the bridges and some gates elsewhere in the one-story part of the building but we haven't really got to the point where we could sit down and make decisions because I mean, I know there was concern like the planetarium here. One of the problems with it is that you pretty much have to have access to the whole school, and if that's something that somebody could just kind of use that one portion um, and not have access to a lot of other yeah, no, areas. So that's just something I just wanted to mention that because I know with a lot of these spaces that you know one of the concerns is whether or not you know that gets, especially with security, you know whether or not that gets access for people that have too many different places to go. No, I think it's a very good point that you make. And the other part of that too is that we're locating bathrooms in those areas. We're strategically placing them so that we can put a gate up and have access to the bathrooms. Okay. Uh, as far as fields go, um, I see two fields where we had four, which gives me uh, a great deal of concern. I mean, this is even at the school level that have basically used all four fields now. And there's even, We've talked about busing them somewhere. There really are no fields available that I know of where you could bus kids from the middle school and have uh, a baseball field and a softball field <coughs> to use of that size. Uh, 90 foot fields are very few in the township. So I don't know where they would go, and to me, busing is not ideal because most of these kids take the sports bus home by the time you bus them out to a location and then bus them back, give you very little time to actually practice. And I know it's, there's been a lot of problems with busing kids, you know, off the school site to other sites. Uh, so that's something that uh, gives me concern. And especially, like I said, forgetting about our programs, it seems like um, just for the middle school alone, you know, you're using all four fields now and now there's only two. Um, and then my other comment would be on the auxiliary gym. Uh, I'm hoping what I'm saying is a full. Let me just uh, in, stop you because I, I, I think I know what you're about to say. There will be seating in the auxiliary gym. It's not shown on that. Okay. That, you know, is that where you were going? That's where I was going. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what I had heard, but I wanted to make sure that uh, 
you know, because I know that when we planned the Maple Glen, we were all under the impression that there was going to be seating there, and wound up that we wound up having a gym that had no seating at all, and they crammed in uh, one or two rows in there just to make something in there. Mike, how many seats would be optimal? Um, I, I would say, we were talking about that, I would say somewhere around 100 seats. You know, we, we, they, I mean, we are fortunate that we have a lot of parents, grandparents that come out to all, all our kids' games. Um, so it's, you know, our, usually the stands are packed at all our gyms, you know, with parents and grandparents and friends. And so, you know, I, that's one of the problems at Maple Glen is we really have to limit what we have there. And we would actually pull some of our teams out of there trying to put some of the younger kids at Maple Glen because the seating is, is a huge problem over there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Danielle. Hi, Danielle Lee and Laura Adamson at Fort Washington Elementary School. Um, some of you might have, I mean, some of you heard some of my comments already, but I'm just repeating them for record. Um, I manage capital projects for the school district of Philadelphia and the design approach that we use is that the spaces that most students use for most of the time is at the top of the priority list and, and for school that's classrooms and um, the current design layout that we have my biggest concern is that the lower four classrooms on the north side and the northwest side as shown they're um, below grade, partially below grade. So we talk about having natural light into classrooms, how important that, important that is, and um, seeing that entire side of one floor does not have maximum or equal amount of natural light exposure, that concerns me. And when I look at the current um, courtyard, which is sloped from main floor level down to the lower lowest or lower floor, full story height, then um, I wonder how disabled students on wheelchairs can enjoy that courtyard as well as able-bodied students. And the explanation that I heard is that they can have access at the top or at the bottom. But you know, that's for me that's not equal opportunity, equal <coughs> enjoyment. So as we talk about, you know, building a new building that gives um, accessibility or solves the access accessibility issues, you know, for a courtyard, which is central to that um, layout, and I know that there are a lot of security reasons, uh, concerns and whatnot, I just see that terrace courtyard to be a problem in terms of maintenance, design, usage. So um, combined with classrooms that are below grade, the terrace courtyard, I would like to ask that um, the architect look at different options, different layouts, so that we can address those issues. I think that's all. Thank you. OK. And, um, just so everyone knows, full disclosure, we, we did get that feedback from Danielle earlier. Uh, I'm not going to go into a detailed response in the interest of time right now, but we are going to look at those issues. Chris. Chris Bradley, I'm from the Willow Road section of Upper Dublin Township. I have three children. My oldest is a graduate of the high school, and I have a 10th grader and an 8th grader. And I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of the Special Education Advisory Council of Upper Dublin, otherwise known as SPEAK. I'd like to thank the members of the board uh, for holding this community meeting tonight. And as we all know, Sandy Run Middle School was built in an era when the needs of disabled students were ignored. Um, sadly, over the years, children with special needs have been denied an education here. So moving forward, we're urging you to consider the needs of these students from the very beginning, from this phase so that we don't repeat our past mistakes. There is a mantra in the disability community, nothing about us without us, and it means that decisions which you know, impact the disability community shouldn't be made without their input. And of course, we feel that input from this diverse and historically segregated group of citizens is very essential. So we've been collecting some feedback from parents 
from, of our, from our group who are going to be having students at Sandy Run in the future. And here are some of their suggestions. Um, and, and keep in mind, these are suggestions that don't just benefit students with disabilities, but all students. We need to carefully consider the proximity of special education classrooms to the elevators, to the bathrooms, but also to the classrooms where they're typically developing peers are, because children with disabilities tend to be somewhat segregated in the design buildings. They put their foot in the wing and off, off to another side. We want to try to avoid that. Um, we'd like to see about planning for sensory and common spaces in the building. I'm not sure if that's been discussed or not, but that's a big concern. We need to assure, ensure that students with mobility impairments have access to all areas of the building, including the outdoor spaces that were just mentioned. Um, along those lines, I just heard tonight that it sounds like we're considering what we have at the high school for elevated areas like, in, like the stage, we're looking at lifts. And I just want to mention that sometimes that is an extra barrier because you need a key to operate the lift. And I run into issues with that at the high school. We couldn't find a key. And so if there's any way we could use ramps, I think that would be really important. Um, we need to make an effort uh, for, toward noise reduction and whatever materials are used to make sure um, spaces aren't too loud. I know the cafeteria at the high school is super loud. Um, there should be areas for students to take assessments in small groups. And seating and tables must be accessible. So please remember that accessibility is more than just about compliance with federal law. It's more than about specifications for ramps or bathrooms. It's about providing access. And my favorite saying is access equals success. A new accessible Sandy Run Middle School will equal success for the child with special needs who can now receive a public education here with their peers. It means success for the adult with a disability who can work here or for the parent with a disability who can now attend events and volunteer here. So thank you so much. I have one extra question I thought of. Um, are the modular, modular classrooms that are going to be utilized in the meantime accessible? What do you think? <laughs> I think yes, but I just have to, I feel like I have to have to know for sure. Yes. So, so there was not, I don't know if there were, if you caught questions in there, more input. Thank you for that input. Uh, just some good news on some of those. Um, the spe all the special ed classrooms are in the classroom wing. Um, uh, we have been talking about some of those spaces being sensory and calming, sensory and or calming spaces. We haven't laid out exactly what's in what space, but it's all in the classroom wing. There is, of course, a guidance suite as well. Um, but yes, all those rooms are in the classroom wing. Uh, the only lift that's in the design right now is the one from the pit to the stage the pit level of the uh, auditorium up to the stage. Um, I asked that same question. Um, so yeah, we'll look at it, but you know, it's a, it, the ramps are big. Um, um, yeah, everything else is on the list already to take into account, so. Uh, Great, Yeah. thank you. Yeah. Good evening, I'm Justin Smith. I have two young boys at um, Sierra Town Elementary. So my first question would be about your um, approach for your special education spaces. Um, within the buildings, that was already addressed. Um, we'll move on to my next one. So one of my questions around what's the technology strategy for the building? Um, as we sit here in 2018, the building's not set to open until 2021, 2022. What are those decisions made around what technology will be used you clarify the question, do you mean uh, as part of the curriculum or do you mean the sort of technology that's in each classroom or can you clarify the question? So I would um, think particularly in terms of technology that's hardwired in the classroom, like thinking about smart boards, um, wireless networks within the building. Um, this is what I do for a little bit, I build marketing platform. The technology moves quickly and I wonder about some of those design decisions that are made today that will be outdated by the time the buildings are in place. Um, can Robin or Gwen or maybe Phil even? Why don't you go ahead, Robin? Phil, why don't you come up while I'm talking? There, there's certain technologies that 
we want to be very cognizant of that we don't want to specify in the construction of the project right at the beginning because by the time the building opens it's going to be approximately two years later and for example telephones intercom systems things like that they can all be antiquated or not the latest thing so there's certain things that we would like to potentially purchase right when the school's ready to open we talked about one this morning perhaps the projector for the planetarium could be purchased at the last at the last minute uh, so there so there are certain technology items that we do want to be careful what we specify in the construction versus purchasing later to have that flexibility does that answer your question that does yeah. okay. I'll just add on a little bit. So, affirming what Robin had said. Who are you? Oh, I'm Bill Vinogrado, Director of Technology. Uh, and so, uh, part of it is we design really around function, right? So, we go back to the, the things that we don't stay constant in the school. Uh, so, you have the cave, the fire pit, and the watering hole, right? This is how human beings gather. We gather in the cave, small group alone, and there's certain level of tech for that. Uh, then we gather around the fire, that's the classroom. So this is a slightly larger group. And the point of the fire is to share, collaborate, and tell stories, right? And so we need a way to make thinking visible. How do we do that? Um, and then finally, we have the watering hole. Big communities all together in large spaces. And what tech do we need for that? Um, then part of the job will be, what are the trends? Where are we going? Um, and then also building in the flexibility, right? So we, on one site visit, I was in one room, it was a TV studio, and uh, there was a, a missing cinder block off of a wall. And I looked, and it, was, and it was on purpose, but I thought it was brilliant, because for me, right, it's always like, I need access. How am I gonna get access? I'm gonna pull out, put in the new, without spending a lot of money. And so it's that kind of flexibility within the design that we'll be thinking about as well. But those are all great questions that keep me up at night as well, so. Do you have more of that? No. Good night. Hi, I'm Veronica Lambert. Um, I live in Fort Washington and have a first grader at Fort Washington Elementary. Um, first of all, I'm really happy to see the planetarium and the design. Um, it, like it wasn't clear if it was going to be in there. One of the architects that was up for the bids didn't include it in their design at all. Um, so I'm happy to see it in place. Um, contrary to what one of the women, what, what the first lady said when she came up, um, that it wasn't, wasn't clear whether the sanitarium was fully in the budget, my understanding from the start was that it is. So I'm hoping that's the case. <laughs> um, within yes, the it is. Budget, <laughs> as it is. People keep saying it's not, it is. It's it's in in the, so that's, I'm glad to hear that, that, <laughs> that, that it's clarified. Um, I guess one of my questions um, one of my questions is about the windows of the building where the classrooms will be and I think there was a point made to that we can't see it in the design and I don't know if it's too early to ask but sometimes when I look at schools the windows are very small I don't know if that's um, intentional or not but to me that seems you know not the right path for um, an education building where the natural sunlight um, is, is important for the students um, and an additional question to that, if you do use a lot of windows, what type of windows would you be using? And does that also come at the end? Are they efficiency windows where you have to keep the heat out in the summer, um, the cool in, like the rest of so. We are early, but probably. We haven't gotten to that level of detail yet for this specific project, but I can tell you what we do on most of the middle schools that we're currently under construction or, or we're planning, is that it's a, it's a thermally broken double pane window that's hermetically sealed. So it, it has an insulation value. It will also have what we call solar band 60 or solar band 70 film applied to the outside, which is for energy efficiency. The idea is to maximize heat in the wintertime and cooling shade in the summertime. So in addition to the windows, We'll probably be using sunscreens on the south and west sides of the building. And then the other part that usually people want to know about windows is uh, the frame, which would be aluminum usually, and the fact that they would be operable and possibly have screens. That's some of the details we have to talk to the school district about. 
Does that give you an yeah. idea? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to, you know, bring it up as a concern in the design when you start putting in windows. Thank you. Kim, you came in a moment too late when we emphatically said that the planetarium is in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jen Kuznets for Washington. Um, I did want to make a note. So on the original, I think back in, it's only found like the 2012 documents for like the assessments of all the buildings, or maybe it was 2014 when Dewey came in for this last assessment. We definitely had eight fields, and now we only have six. So I do think that that is a concern. Um, and what's also concerning to me is the status of those fields at the time that they were assessed was wet and which makes sense because I'm sure there's not very good drainage in floodplains. And so now with this courtyard being terraced down, sloping toward the ball fields, I'm assuming it's we're just now guiding that runoff right down into the field. So I know that we have a runoff issue at Fort Washington with their fields and we've basically abandoned that baseball field because it's constantly saturated. So that's one reason why I'm not a big fan of the courtyard. Also, there, I just don't see us taking very good care of our terraces because we pretty much have the staff to mow. That's pretty much what we do. That's why there's a lot of landscaping issues. So I cannot imagine we're going to have people weed whacking around the buildings. And I just don't see it happening, unfortunately. Um, and if we decide that we're going to cover those all with concrete, then you're basically baking those lower classrooms, which is what we have an issue at Fort Washington as it is with the blacktop or the hardtop right up against the windows. So I just see that as a big concern. And also just opening the windows for ventilation I don't think would really work because the air would be stagnant. And if people are having outdoor classrooms, you can't open those windows either. So it doesn't seem like it's very useful. Um, I'm just curious where carpool in that plan, it looks like everyone's being funneled out the one road. So yeah, I couldn't tell because I saw the way the buses were going. I was just wondering how carpool would run, just out of curiosity. Um, and right now, the building is how many square feet too big? Like what we... I don't... Do you have that number right now? I'm not sure. But. Ten, is it like 10,000 square feet too big? Because uh, it's... Well, 217,000 is what it is now, right? We're trying to get it to how big? No, it's about, we're down to about 215. We're cutting square footage out of it every day, so it's a constantly moving target, yeah. Okay, so is this plan the 215? Because if it's the same drawing of the operations meeting, that was 217,000. That probably was. That probably was. So is, but is this plan we saw tonight, the 215,000 square foot version? Yes. Okay, so it's different. If I take this, it's different than what I saw a couple weeks ago. Probably, yeah, because every day we're changing. Okay. Um, also, hang on, I have one more question. Oh, I'm just curious, um, the other workshops that you're doing, the township that you did today, and the teacher workshops, are those also being reported so we can just kind of see what the township needs are, what the teachers' needs are, would be an interesting, you know, piece of information to see. And then uh, I guess I'd like to see a list of what we have now in this building, what the amenities are. I know I brought it up the other night, Mark, at a PTO meeting. What, like how many classrooms we have, the size, the square footage of our auditorium now versus what it's going to be, how many we had then versus what we're going to get now, the square footage of all the collaborative spaces, the hallways, all that kind of stuff. What we have now versus what we're going to get because if we're going to, you know, spend $70 million 120 million when it's all financed and paid for. I'm hoping we're getting a lot more than what we already kind of have. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Okay, just so everyone's clear, the reason we just sort of naturally did that Jen asked all the questions and then we answered is because that's what we do every other week at a board committee meeting. So I'll try to answer some of those. Um, uh, can, uh, Bob or somebody concerned about drainage into the fields from courtyard or, or any water management? Uh, uh, th there'll be great improvements to the site with regard to the detention of the stormwater before it gets put into the Sandy Creek. Uh, we're going to be using pipes and underground detention basins. We also have some above ground possible detention basin areas. So uh, the 
stormwater runoff will be greatly controlled and improved relative to what you have right now. What we can't control are how much the site is going to flood, and we can't affect where the boundary is for the floodplain. We're not allowed to change that because that's all part of what the DEP looks at to make sure that you're percolating water down into the grade and into the aquifer. So they don't want us to diminish that. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Thanks. Um, carpool, if you look at the at your diagram, um, comes in just like it does today over the bridge and then follows along the road to the right and then can go along the other side of the lane that goes up by the buses where the Chevron bus parking is. So it goes all the way around there. So the same sort of flow where it is now, it's just much further from the bridge. So it hopefully won't back all the way up to the bridge because there's just a lot more room for a lot more cars. But it does follow the same entrance. The, we're viewing the Twining Road entrance as the entrance and exit. Um, the other meetings are not being recorded. Those are not um, public meetings at the moment. Um, uh, the only ones uh, that have happened so far, as you mentioned, are the teacher. Uh, there were some teacher leaders who met with us, and then uh, the township this morning. Uh, and amenities compared to with the proposed building, um, I don't think we're it, it, it moves. Um, so, but we can put that together at some point. I think once we nail down. Uh, this, this stage of the building, we can we can nail down exactly. Counting classrooms is actually really hard. It turns out what you count as a classroom is is very ambiguous. I've learned, um, uh, but we can we can do our best to count um, the number of spaces with the hallways. Uh, those kinds of questions, um, but we're not we're not ready for that yet because it's just too much in flux. Yes, sir. What was your last name? I'm sorry. Dash. Dash. And I live directly behind the school. And the first opportunity to look at this, um, I guess my observation or comment is She'll speak to my I'm surprised that there's no uh, change in the entrances. The, the talk about a carpool um, coming up from Twine, I don't think it's going to happen. If you take your uh, plan and turn it over, You'll see how it's going to be used. Audubon is going to, because the school's now closer to Audubon than the existing school. So my three observations are, um, you don't have the elevations. I don't know how high it's going to impact the neighborhood as far as views that are decent right now. I think moving the building direct or as close to the property line as possible and higher is going to be uh, negatively impacting the neighborhood. Um, when you talk about being a good neighbor, right now the uh, shipping and receiving is down where it's not facing any neighbors. Three sides of the property do not have neighbors. Uh, the, you chose to put the receiving facing the neighbors. Um, and right now, Dr. Clark, why are the walkers having to wait for the buses to leave? <laughs> now, it's, it's, it, I'm wondering if it has something to do with um, the design of the school. I'll answer that. There was a near miss with one of our student walkers recently. Um, by, a, by an, a parent from an opposing school coming, racing to meet their child at the same time the bus dropped them off for an event. So we're asking that, um, because the buses and the cars all share the crosswalk or the pathway for our students leaving at the Audubon Road exit. So we're asking the students who use that exit to wait 10 minutes in the school until the vehicular and bus traffic has slowed down like I said in my listserv, to further ensure their safety as walkers. Okay, and that goes to my concern down the road when, uh, I'm sorry, the school board member here, Dave? Mark. Mark, you said that there's, they're talking about eliminating Audubon as um, for access or for emergency. Uh, I don't know why you don't put in a second entrance and eliminate Audubon completely um, from that point, because I, I think that this situation 
There's a stop sign there that's not enforced. It's a roll through stop sign that no one stops at. You're, you don't have a crosser, but you tell the kids to just wait till the buses leave. So I don't think you're addressing a situation that's only going to um, be worse, made worse from this new uh, location of school. And I just want to say, I don't think the school should be any closer to the property lines than the annex is now. I think that uh, the neighborhood predates uh, Sandy Run Middle School. And that's, that's all. I think you did a great job with the design. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we would, I think we would all love to eliminate the Audubon entrance. Art especially brings it up as often as we possibly can. Uh, every meeting. Um, it's unfortunately we need two entrances and exits from the property for uh, emergency purposes. Uh, and the way the intersection, which is a fairly major intersection, sits, uh, and the sight lines for that intersection, we there just isn't space to build another one. Um, as much as so, this is one of the challenges of the site. We we would all love to not have to have that entrance. Um, but we have not is found it, an alternative. Is it still going to be used for buses and for the, 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 the intent is the intent? The intent well, so there was a meeting this morning that I was not at. Is was that discussed this morning? Can someone comment on that? The question came up for the first time today about how many buses go in and out of bottom lot. I did not have time to find the answer today, um, but it's something that we're going to be looking at. So we have talked about making that entrance um, emergency only or one way certain times a day or certain vehicular, certain types of vehicles at some times a day or, you know, exactly what it will be. We haven't decided, but it will be limited and the intent is uh, that all traffic should be using the, the main entrance, which is the 20 road entrance. Including construction. Well, that's a whole other. We haven't figured out construction because we may be able to put a temporary driveway uh, along the 20 road side. Um, we haven't gotten clearance for that yet. We're kind of hoping that we can. We might be able to find other offsite parking for that. We, we, that still could be determined. Arif, just speak a little bit about construction and where we are with that and the entrances and exits and it, the first thing I, I indicated when we were looking at this plan is in the perfect world there should be an entrance and exit of the building on Lime Kill. We've pursued that, we spoke a bit to the township and we've been told that it cannot be done either a reef or, or a Mr. Breslin can, can expand that and why it cannot be done on, on, on Lime Kill. So, um, first of all, we are going to do a limited traffic study. That limited traffic study um, is going to be part of the requirement. Uh, we, and, you know, somebody asked about meetings with the township. So there's going to be sketch plan, preliminary plan meetings, uh, final plan meetings with the township planning commission, as well as supervisors. And all those meetings, of course, are recorded and uh, available to the public. So there's going to be a whole process on the land development. But the one thing that I think will hopefully address the traffic flow for the site on the site as well as on the adjacent roads will be a limited traffic analysis will be part of the plan. We're going to do that as soon as we get, again, the schematic plan fixed up. During that process, we are also going to look at the traffic flow for construction. My initial reaction is that um, you know, the traffic flow will have to share the driveway off a twining road and not um, obviously come in through Audubon. They may be... Say that again? Two entrances on twine. There's only one bridge. Um, unless we want to build a bridge, which is a whole other process. We're not doing that. So, but to answer your question, what I'm looking at... Well... Right. Again, we're coming through the, uh, I think there's still a floodplain there. It's a floodplain there. I'm not sure we're going to be able to bear construction traffic through there. But if you let me finish first, so my initial reaction is that the driveway, current driveway off line kiln, as soon as you come to that um, V, um, at that point we will maybe create a separate traffic flow that will come around to the classroom wing 
and be able to access the back of the building and bring some construction traffic there. I am also going to tell you there will be periods probably where we will need to use some access to the Audubon. And um, again, it'll be on a very temporary uh, basis, but so I don't want to tell you that there'll be none at all, but we are going to look very carefully at that. We're going to try to be uh, very concerned about, of course, being good neighbors, minimizing dust and convenience, but um, it is a large project. We build a lot of large projects in neighborhoods all the time. Some of them are shared driveways that just go right past um, people's front doors, and there's really uh, not much you can do about it, but here we're going to try very hard to look at all the options before a final decision is made. And there'll be an entire phasing plan um, and information given on that once we get um, further along in the design. The other things in there are good input that we will um, we'll look at. We're not ready yet, I think, to talk about height of the building compared to the existing building, et cetera, but it's something we can, um, we can look at and, and uh, publish once we actually have numbers to publish. Oh, yeah, that's what I mean, the, height, the total height of the building relative to the existing buildings. Um, or really, I guess the question is how it impacts the view from, from the neighborhood. Right. Um, okay. I think, uh, was there anything else in there? Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Go ahead. Hey, you Ted Fricker. Uh, class of 93, Liv and Drescher, two kids right now in Jarrettown. A couple questions. Um, I can do it just uh, if you want. You can address all those. That's fine. Um, I agree about the entrance on Audubon. That access... You're welcome to lift the mic if you just <laughs> 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 So <laughs> that access at Martin Lane on Line Kiln is a hazard. It's been a hazard for years. It's only getting worse with traffic up. So just, I, it's a shame we can't utilize the traffic light somehow with this. It, it makes sense, but I, again, I don't, it, this is the time to improve if we're going to do it in the township. You would think we'd want to divert access off of Martin if possible, but that's for you guys to decide. Um, if we're trying to be a good neighbor to the, to the neighborhood, why are we running the buses and the trucks along the property line? That seems to be sort of at odds with each other. I don't know. Just I don't live there either. Just if I was a neighbor, I don't think I'd be happy about that. Um, question for you, actually. Do we use the second gym in the attics a lot? We, okay, I didn't realize that. that was good. My question was why. Are you? Interesting. I didn't know that. Okay, that explained the second gym then, because I wasn't aware of that. When we toured the second gym, it seemed very small. It seemed, almost seemed unusable, so I wasn't sure about that. Um, I sort of near, I think I mirror the sentiments of people here. The courtyard to me seems like almost an unnecessary expense, especially when you consider the efficiency of the building, you're creating more outdoor space against windows and walls and things like that. Uh, I think if we're looking at a green building, which I'm sure we are since we did with the high school, I think we have to consider things like that. So if, if that plays a role, I'm curious to see what the cost projection is adding a courtyard versus not having a courtyard, especially with the concerns about accessibility, things like that. Um, and I just want to endorse the planetarium. I went there as a kid. I loved it. I look back on it. Mr. Pierce was great. Um, my, my kids enjoy it. They love the trips there. I think it should be in the budget no matter what. Um, someone's paying taxes here, so I hope that has some kind of a seat at the table. So, thank you. The only thing I feel like I can really comment on there was um, the courtyard serves not only the purpose of, I mean, it, it, the main purpose really is to get natural light into as many spaces as we can, but it also helps the building step down the hill. So it's not like you can just eliminate it and slide the building up. Robin, anything else to say about that? Uh, no, I think you got a great mark. I think we're utilizing the courtyard to step the building down the hill more economically. That's the intention. Hi, uh, Pamela Tepsky. I have two middle schoolers. One at Fort Washington. Not that really matters. Anyway, um, I have a couple questions. Uh, one big question I have is about the ball fields, which he had mentioned before. Ball fields are always an issue. Um, not quite sure how that will legitimately be uh, addressed. I mean, I realize it's kind of a building design issue, but your option one, I mean, I know we're not going back to option one, but option one, while I don't remember why you scrapped that and went to 3B, but um, it seemed to have a lot more play field area. And like other people have expressed, like sometimes the fields are wet and sometimes they're whatever. Um, but they're definitely being used all the time for all the sports. 
middle school sports and of course the UJA sports. So eliminating two fields just I don't even can't even bring my I can't wrap my brain around how you would do that. <laughs> other than busing them somewhere else. Busing is obviously an issue. Seventh grade didn't even have baseball and softball today because there was no bus. So that's a problem. Um, I watched the 419 operations meeting, riveting. Um, but one of the <laughs> one of the comments that was made was, and I know you said that the planetarium was in the budget. That was said. But in the meeting, I just want to ask for more clarification. So in the presentation, it said the potential planetarium, which was then. Uh, Reiterated by saying that there was a, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying um, the comment was made that there was a possible alternate bid. I don't know what that means. One and number two, it was also stated that they weren't sure that the district had made a final decision on that. That's what was stated in the operations meeting. My question is one. Um, what is this possible bid, and has that already been addressed, and it's totally accepted, and that's done, right? And then two, that's basic, is that what you're saying by saying you have it in the budget? They presented a possible bid, you accepted the possible, like, this is where I'm getting confused. Yes, it's in the budget currently, but it said an alternative, a possible alternative bid was what was stated, which so, is confusing to me. Yeah, I can see why. I'm just asking for clarification on that. So bids, we haven't had any bids, so it's not correct to say that, you know, it's been bid, and uh, that's not that's not what happens. So bids don't happen until we've got a full design. We're actually ready to build something. Right, but that's a separate so, bid. As well. Right. So what a pop, what an alternate bid means is that as part of the bid document, you say we'd like to build all this and maybe this or maybe not this. How much more or less would it cost if we did or didn't do this? And then the, when the construction firms submit their bid, they list that as a line item you can either add or delete. So that's what an alternate bid is. We had talked originally of having the planetarium as an alternate bid, and so that's why you saw when we had the architect interviews and they presented concept plans, the ones who actually included the planetarium, included them as sort of at the edge of the building so that it was an easy thing to be an alternate or to be included or not. Um, the entire time the planetarium has been in the budget, sure. the question is, the question was, um, are we sure at the time, you know, when we started the process, are we sure we want a planetarium? So right now we are, we want, we we are planning as though we want a planetarium. You saw it's right in the middle of the building. You can't, you just um, right. have no, to another you. 40 square foot. I'm just saying April 19th was not that long ago. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a definitive then. So I'm just clarifying. Okay. Um, another point I had was that I watched another meeting where the English department talked about their fabulous flash fiction and their poetry reading things that they have for eighth grade, which I will say are phenomenal. Um, but they were addressing concerns about the fact that they have to use a hallway to do this and have parents come in and set everything up and it's a big, and I guess I'm not clear on even the loose design because nothing's set in stone. Where would an alternative be for something like that other than in a hallway? Like I'm, <laughs> I mean, I see some of these other spaces, but they don't seem to be large enough to hold an entire audience of parents and all the kids work and that runs normally down the hallway in front of the offices. Just right. It actually was in the classrooms last year when my student went through it, but um, not in hallways. But I can see how that would be less good. Um, we have a small group and large group spaces built in, so if you look sort of at the knuckle where the angle classroom wing is, there's an open space and a sort of a glass enclosed space. We talked about that having that be openable into a large space. There's the library, there's the planetarium, there's the auditorium, there's the gyms, there's the cafeteria. Um, there's one of the, one pair of classrooms we've talked about having a uh, movable wall, um, which I think is shown on the, in the center section on the north side of the, of the plan as it reads right now, although things can move. Um, what other large group spaces do we have in there? But there's also, this, well, project based learning room probably isn't appropriate for that use, but that is a large space. Right, so you're saying all those things like, because the library currently isn't large enough for that, so you're saying that the library would be designed in a way that would be big enough yeah. for that? Yeah, one of the, I should, it's worth pointing out, one of the things we 
as we designed the building from the start, we looked at through the existing buildings, what do we like and don't like. And yeah, I mean, the existing library, while it is actually large in square footage, is unusable for large groups with us. We just throw a pole through the middle. We, yes, that won't happen. Um, another question I had was when you were regarding the floodplain. Is that in reference to a 100-year floodplain, or is, is it's that? A, it's a 100-year or 500-year. What, what floodplain is that that's marked on the plan? It's either the 100-year or the 500-year. Uh, I thought it was 100 years. Okay, and then um, and then with that, um, I wasn't clear about the um, whether or not we would be addressing the lead certification uh, type of situation. There was some talk about it at another meeting, but it didn't seem definitive. So the lead certification, we will make a final decision. Um, as we move further along here in the project, but generally speaking, the current lead requirements under version four are very challenging at best for a urban, uh, for a suburban type uh, school project. Um, it's very heavily weighted on urban projects in terms of getting uh, credits, um, so it gets very challenging to meet um, gold or silver levels, which are the only levels that actually provide you with any type I'm of going platinum? funding. <laughs> very difficult to do that. It's a simple matter of money, Pam. No, so it's very, if you look at late version 4 and actually just go on the website, you'll see there's a, a total outcry from the entire professional and public perception on what they've done with the new lead requirements to actually meet the higher certifications that qualify you for certain additional funding to help support and guide that. So right now it doesn't look very positive, but um, a final decision has not been made. If we can talk a little bit about the components that, that Breslin incorporate that are lead yep. in the building, even though there may not be the certification, there's a lot of the components that we're looking at in the building that would follow lead. And I can let Robin add to that, but certainly today's design requirements uh, by the energy code requirements and by the building code, um, you basically are doing a lot of the strategies that are required by LEED. And that's why LEED has specifically increased those levels. So the energy performance um, of the building envelope, the orientation of the building, as Robin talked about, the type of light systems and natural daylighting, all of those, um, you know, what I would call basic lead requirements that translate directly to improvements in, in usability and functionality of the school, those are all going to be incorporated as part of the design. So you get those anyway. Um, you just won't have a third party review of verifying some of that information. Um, okay, thanks. And the last um, thing I was going to add was that on the very first realignment task force. I know, oh, sorry, I know um, Jen has some, asked something about classroom spaces and numbers, but I, my recollection from that first task force was that they walked through every building and counted classrooms. So, I mean, I, I really wasn't sure exactly the question she asked, but I feel like that was done yeah. years ago. Yeah, I mean, I can give you like the number of classrooms we have in this build, in the proposed building right now. The question is, right, does just, that actually, can, is that the same you know, would you count this one or not that, you know, or that one may not be the same as we counted in the past. So if you want an apples to apples comparison, we have to kind of do it again. Right, I see what you're saying. Okay, just, I was thinking, I think that's it for now. Okay. I have Tadashi Matsuda. I have a, a daughter in Fort Washington. I have uh, two questions. One, I'm sure is uh, addressed and aware uh, with the classroom being isolated from the main building with two bridge and three staircase, is that sufficient for egress? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. We haven't done a full code study, but we will do one. We may find out that maybe one of the stair towers needs to be widened or something similar to that. But basically, from a conceptual standpoint, yes, it meets code. Okay. And just to clarify that, there's one, there's not two bridges, there's one bridge. Oh, right. The other one's a hallway. Got it. Uh, and the other one is, um, uh, you know, people keep talking about this uh, $70 million. Um, 
what part of it is building, what part of it is stuff that goes in it, what, uh, what part of it is utility, is, that, is there a breakdown that uh, the community can get access to and have an opinion of uh, beer, uh, building materials, uh, you know, you don't, it's a middle school, we don't need a, a marble countertop and uh, bathrooms and such. So um, it'll, be, it'll be nice to see a, a breakdown. That's a, yeah, I mean, we don't have the detail about the countertops, but there, um, but there is a document on the website on the Sandy Run Project page um, that may or may not be easy to navigate to. I'm not sure off the top of my head, um, but it does break down how much of that is building and how much of it is site work and how much of it is uh, contingency and how much of it is soft costs. Yeah, those okay. kinds of things. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, Dave Fryer. I have a. Uh, 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 good evening. Hi, my name is Dave Fryer. I have a daughter in kindergarten in Jarrettown and one who's in pre K will be entering Jarrettown in two years. So, first of all, I want to thank you for your time and I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to weigh in. Um, I'm really encouraged by what I see and I uh, can't wait to see what the final outcome is of this. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, and comments. One, I too am in favor of the planetarium. My daughter's uh, class has come down to the school, I guess, once or twice this year, and every night uh, she raves about it and is really excited uh, to talk about her day at the planetarium. Um, the next question is, and I'm sure I know the answer to this, but one of the plants you showed up there had a track in it, and then this plan does not. Um, I also see that there's an outdoor basketball court. Um, I'm wondering if you could address why track was removed, um, and if you have an outdoor basketball court, would you consider also adding one or two tennis courts to accompany the outdoor basketball court? So I'll let you address those and ask another question. Uh, the track that was in there was a small track, a small jogging track. Uh, we were told by our um, phys ed and, and sports folks that it wasn't worth it unless it was you know, a big six lane track, and it wasn't. Uh, and in order to even get that, we lost a bunch of parking and made the field on the inside of it quite small because it was a, it was a compact track. Uh, we do intend to have, as we do now, you know, a way you can do a loop all the way around the property. So we measure it. But it's not the same as obviously not the same as a track, but it's um, at least something. By the way, that's not the, that's not the reason why I thought it was eliminated, so that's good enough. Okay. Um, the, uh, the court is actually a memorial basketball court from how long ago, Jill? Do you know? Oh, I don't remember the exact year, but I was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, was a, it was dedicated to a student who passed away, um, and so we've committed to, um, and we have one now, it's down by the cafeteria, so we've com committed to maintaining it, and that's why we have a, a basketball court near there. Great. Yeah. I would just ask you to maybe consider a tennis court or two as well to, to accompany that as well. Um, one of the other questions I had was related to the number of classrooms. Um, I know you addressed it, we still haven't settled on the final number, but are you building the, this, the, this school with the number of classrooms in mind for the current student population come 2020, or are you allowing for growth beyond that um, and building in some flexible classrooms that could then be um, uh, modified as needed? Um, so let me just say, what we're talking about for classroom for regular ed core subject classrooms, uh, we're looking at 42, um, 14 per grade, uh, that's including science. Um, but in addition to that, there's four languages, art, fan, con, um, tech ed, computing, uh, health, um, there's uh, special ed classrooms, there's, you know, there's many more than 42 rooms that will be used for classes. Okay, so there is um, but there's four, four, 42 core subject classrooms. Um, that is, uh, we do do enrollment studies every year. We've done our own for, um, you know, forever. Uh, and we've had, we commissioned studies from Montgomery County Planning Commission who have access to additional data, including things like birth rates and that sort of thing. Um, and our, all the forecasts suggest we're roughly level uh, for 10 years, and now, you know, beyond 10 years, you never know. Um, Upper Dublin is mostly built out, so it's not likely that we're going to have a massive boom like we had in, say, the 1960s, um, unless, you know, all the houses get knocked down and apartments 
get built or something like that. But um, so we're, bit, we're we're assuming roughly flat. The total population of the school we're looking at is approximately 950, with occasional swelling where it would become a little tight. Yeah, I know in, in your opening remarks, you said you want to build a building that will last for about 50 years. And I just hope you're keeping an open mind and realizing that things can change, you know, beyond the 10 years that you're planning for as well. So we don't encounter similar problems that we have at a number of the schools uh, in the district. Um, and then lastly, uh, just curious, when, when I went in the middle school I went to, which was almost 30 years ago, there were study halls. I don't know if study halls are still prevalent in uh, schools these yeah, days? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, because my daughter goes, does go to Jarrettown where there's no air conditioning, I just want to confirm that we'll be It will, of course, be air conditioned. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, the Scott Rosenthal Memorial Basketball Court was established in 1992. That's when the 11-year-old Scott passed. Anyone else? Hi, my name's uh, Pete Laser. I live uh, in Ambler. I have uh, three small children. One, uh, one will go to uh, Sandy Run next year and live through all the construction, and uh, and then uh, the next two will will uh, benefit from it. Um, just one quick comment. I I uh, I'm an architect turned developer, so I don't quite do what you guys do anymore, but um, understand some of this stuff. Um, I do. Uh, like the courtyard, and I understand how you're trying to mitigate, you know, from one grade level to another. And I think it's important to maintain um, small scale outdoor spaces that are, you know, scaled to children and, and places that they can uh, learn. Uh, uh, the one question I have is, uh, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but um, is there a some kind of pre-construction uh, budgeting? company that's helping you guys to figure out this budget as you move along? I'm not sure. You may be asking about a reef, uh, or you may be asking about our financial advisors. I'm not. So our approach on uh, budgeting is there'll be a, a schematic design budget, there'll be a design development budget, and then there'll be CE budgets, construction document budgets. We have a certified professional estimator in the office. Um, so his team will develop the budget. The budget will be, of course, reviewed by me, myself. Um, there'll then be a reconciliation of the budget between us and the architectural team. Um, and then that will basically form the basis for the budget at each of the stages. Okay, but but um, there there are no construction companies that are pre-estimating this work. In other words, you're you're going to send this out to bid, and then you're going to figure out. No, that's what I'm saying. We're doing the budgeting with our certified professional estimator. We budget for multiple projects all throughout Pennsylvania public schools. So we're doing the estimate, and then the estimate will be reconciled, like I said, with the architect. We do use our database of previous projects for some of the items. We do reach out to vendors and get confirmation of certain things. So it's a whole process. It's not one person just doing it by themselves. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my other question is, was, uh, um, and I, I don't go a lot of these meetings, to a lot of these meetings, so forgive me if I'm asking questions that you answer in other meetings, but um, what, at any time was a design build uh, construction considered to accelerate the timeline? So this is uh, Pennsylvania public bidding law requirements. Um, there are some very strict requirements and uh, basically there's no mandate waivers or options available to that. This also requires public bidding with separate prime contractors under the Multi-Prime Separations Act. So we're required to comply with all the rules. Uh, design build is not permissible for a public project. In Pennsylvania. Uh, and my last question is really about design. Um, you know, I my children aren't old enough uh, to go to the high school yet. Um, I don't spend a lot of time there. Obviously, a lot of money was spent. There's zinc panels on the outside. It's it's a pretty building. But um, what what steps are you taking in the design to treat the building itself as an education tool? Uh, you know, spaces that 
would teach about architecture, engineering, arts, and environmental engineering, you know, things like that, that, you know, other than a breakout room or, you know, a pretty view, what other components are you intending to, uh, you know, implement in the building that would, that would help kids, you know, do more than just go to school? So that's, uh, you know, using the building as a teaching tool is what you're talking about. And um, but there's a lot of strategies that we've used before, but I, I can tell you that at the middle school level, um, it's, it's challenging to come up with exactly what those ideas are. I'm open to any that you may have. We'd be happy to hear them if you have specific ones that you think can be implemented. Um, I know at a recent school, it's actually a LEED Platinum building. Uh, you know, they, we did all kinds of things, which, um, and I'll be honest with you, the building is now eight years old, and they don't use it. You need a champion in the school from a curriculum standpoint that's really going to uh, capitalize on that. We put dashboard systems in where they can see the HVAC systems. The building's got solar panels. they got dashboards for that. There's weather stations on the roof. In the mechanical rooms, we put glass doors so they could actually see what the mechanical room looks like. Um, and you know, so we did a lot of those things. And uh, to be honest with you, I think some of the best things we can do is during construction itself, those we felt have had the most impact, is incorporate something with uh, Dr. Clark, where there's some um, you know exposure during construction for certain activities, and explain to them what how concrete is made. You know, perhaps teach them a little bit about um, you know what ductwork is and how HVC systems and lighting systems relate. Um, but when, with the finished building, I think, um, as I said, I'm open to any ideas you have, um, but I think it gets very challenging at the middle school to really open the building up um, as a teaching tool. Um, so if you have some specific ideas, if you'd be willing to share them, that would be good, and we'll try to see how we can incorporate them. But um, at this point, we haven't really talked about any specific ideas like that, to be honest with you. Thank you for your time. I'm Babs Krug from Maple Glen. My husband and I both started teaching here at Sandy Run in 1969. Um, between us, we taught here for probably 75 years, and our grandchildren will go to school here. So um, we have the past and we have the future going. And as I look at this plan, I was a language teacher. I taught all the way over there and had to go to the annex to teach. I know how far it is to go from one end to the other. And I'm looking at this and I see the um, phys ed locker rooms on the left-hand side of the plan as I look at it. And I see the, most of the outdoor facilities, the fields on the right-hand side of the plan. It doesn't look like an easy job to get middle school kids from here to there. Why is it arranged like that? Why not flip that building, that part of the building? Have you considered that? The very first design that we did was like that, and we flipped the cafeteria and the gym so that the cafeteria could take advantage of the views so that we could get the loading dock uh, out of the front of the building and put it up where the services enter the site, the utilities. But the other thing that as we developed the plans, the fields in the upper left-hand corner became more and more prominent and looked like if, we're, if we could do an artificial field, an artificial turf field, that's where that location would be, which is right outside of the gym. So, we see those potential fields being used more heavily than the ones in the floodplain. Unless, of course, you want to play baseball. Well, I have baseball players, but... <laughs> but we're talking about during gym class. <laughs> yeah, they don't play much baseball during gym class. Okay. Logical reason. Thank you. Um, Mark, if I could just add one thing that, that reminded me actually, and that uh, you can come up, sir. I'm sorry. But I, while you're coming up, I just could add one thing. Um, you know, the, the, the loading receiving area by Ottawa, and I know that was brought up before, and even as of today, we were out there um, analyzing utilities 
and um, how the utilities would service the new building and also have to be maintained for the existing building as well as for the modulus. And, um, you know, strategically, for whatever reason, Audubon is the main door for all of the utilities. The high voltage electrical service comes in through there. The large gas line goes right through there and crosses there. The water line comes in through there. The data, phone, everything is coming exactly through Audubon to feed the uh, building. So I just wanted to also put that out there. That is also a major phasing, but also an implementation issue that if we try to move the mechanical room completely from that location to the opposite side, it will add another level of complication as well as cost to relocate, which we already have to modify, relocate those major services to the other side. I just wanted to mention that as you consider your comments. Hi. Um, my name is Andy Rappaport. I am a longtime resident of Upper Dublin. It's all relative. I know people have been here longer than me, for 20 years. I have a son uh, in Jarrettown, fourth grade. I have a son here in seventh grade in Sandy Run, and I have a freshman at the high school. Uh, so first thing I wanna, just after seeing and hearing the presentation tonight, it seems like the, the board and uh, the committee who selected the architect made a good decision. So uh, things obviously are challenging, but uh, thank you. I also wanna thank, uh, Something is refreshing having the township, the Upper Dublin Township of the School District uh, include the public in some of these decisions. I think that is uh, commendable and thank you for doing that. I think it's only going to lead to uh, a, a better school and this is a very exciting time. Uh, so, uh, also, I, uh, I've been supplying school furniture and equipment for over 25 years. Obviously, I started on seven. <laughs> so, uh, I am the owner of Next Gen Furniture, which is also locally based here in, in Upper Dublin in Fort Washington. I recently, my company and myself, was involved uh, for a long, lengthy process in helping to design, and uh, we are refurnishing next month the new Cedar Brook Middle School. And I don't know if anyone has had a chance. I know we saw a couple other schools that have had walkthroughs. This school, Cedar Brook, is a very 21st century uh, type of school with a high emphasis on uh, collaborative learning environments and uh, movement in the classrooms. I'm not sure, and I know I'm probably six months or a year early when we talk about, you know, but I, I do know that uh, probably this process starts immediately. I mean, I've worked on it for over a year. We met more than a dozen, you know, a couple dozen times with the staff, the principal, the staff, the architect. Uh, so I want to, you know, I have a PowerPoint presentation that, that shows and illustrates what they're doing, the classroom layouts and the furniture. Uh, some of it's a little bit modern, let's call it. Uh, Walkley stools, tables that stand, marker board top tables. So it's very exciting, a lot of what you do in the school and, and the Spaces, especially the collaboration spaces, the student lounge, STEM, STEAM, maker space, it has a lot to do with the, what you put in there and, and the furniture that's selected, and that can really have a lot to do with the building and uh, how it's used. So I'm going to share that uh, PowerPoint with, the, you know, I'll, I'll email it to uh, Brenda and, and, and some, I think maybe some, you know, a couple other people. I, I, I already sent it to Dr. Clark. The school is being furnished, uh, Cedar Book is actually being furnished next month in May after a lengthy, uh, they did renovations instead of the new building, so there were a lot of delays. I'm, I'm glad that we're doing the new building to avoid some of those delays, headache that was supposed to be open a year ago. So we're, everything is being installed in May, and so I think that it's going to get plenty of time for, to take, you know, for people to make arrangements to go over there and take a look at play. Really think it's important to see, you know, as you're making, you're making these decisions to see what's gonna work best uh, for our community and the school. I know for myself, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I, you know, some of the stuff, the wobbly schools and, you know, some of the items in there are a little bit 
you know, they're not as traditional, but I, you know, I'm not sure that I guess Dr. Clark and, and her staff are going to decide what's going to be best for the community. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of introduce myself and hopefully if I can be of any help in the process, uh, hope that uh, I think that that would be something that I would be willing to do and then, uh, you know, I think it would be a benefit, it would only benefit the process. So if anybody, you know, yeah, well, thanks. It's good to know you're here. Um, you are, as you say, a little bit early, um, but when we get into the design development phase um, and we're working with uh, each of the departments on um, how, how they want their classrooms to be laid out and furnished, uh, not just classrooms, all the spaces. Yeah, well, um, you know, Gilbert yeah. Architects was the one who built the high school, and they are the ones who built Cedar Point. Now, I, I, I worked uh, very closely with them on the uh, Designs and the, you know the different requirements that for the school had and, and ultimately their bid package. Now, is that something that the architects here are involved with? You know, I know each architect is different. Is there going to be involvement with the architect in that process? The in the next phase, the design development phase, is when we'll get into the development of the furniture. What type of furniture? the school district would you like to use in the classrooms, the type of specialized furniture that might be utilized in the planetarium. You know, there's all that kind of stuff. We're not quite there yet, and it's not quite time to talk about it because we won't reach our scheduled goals of what we have to get to between now and then, but it's coming. And at a certain point, Gwen in particular, will sit down with uh, all the teachers and design all those spaces and the specific types of furniture that they want to use. If the school district wishes at that point, we could get input from. Yeah, what are we using for a budget number? I mean, do you have a budget number for the FF, you know, the furniture package? Yeah, it's too early to, to have that. Um, I don't know. Give you a number, number that, that, that Cedarbrook used. It's a public number. It's nine hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars. No. But I would say that would be on the high So when, when we get there, um, I mean, tours of buildings are definitely something we're interested in doing. It's good to know that there's a nearby school that won't have, te have students in there at the time that, um, that we might be able to tour. Uh, so I appreciate that input, and, uh, and we'll definitely consider that as we, once we get into that phase. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah. Anyone, if anybody else does want to speak, you might as well come down just so, or kind of just Anyone else thinking of speaking? You know, I won't hold you to it. Just one more. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I am Kevin Matthews. I have a student here at Sandy Run and one at uh, Fort Washington Elementary. Uh, I haven't been to old meetings, so forgive me if this has been answered, but uh, it's been a little bit of talk tonight about how the new school compares to the existing, but I think more important is how does it compare to our program? Did we meet the program that we set out with uh, when we started this process? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so you were on the committee that where uh, last summer, for everyone's benefit, we did have a committee that looked into a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm actually going to have it right here. We have a schedule of rooms, um, and it has been modified very slightly since since then. But yeah, we're on we're on that schedule. Great. Uh, do we require any variances to build this building? We don't know for sure, but we're in the process of identifying them right now. We may need one for the height of the building. We have to cal do those calculations. First of all, we have to get the schematic design set, and then we have to do those calculations. But look, we're likely that we'll have to get at least one variance and sign each other. Usually that comes with every every middle school or high school because they're done, they're in residential neighborhoods and the sign sizes are limited and we want to get bigger signs so that people can the signs. But no setback issues or anything of that sort? No, no, we're not, we're not anticipating any very difficult ones. Okay. Um, as you move into DDs, uh, have you started to talk about the HVAC system and if you have central plan or uh, the X system? As we move into DDs, we will talk about all those things and define them all and budget them. Right now, we're not. We're still deciding does the gym want to be on this side of the building or the other side of the building? Sure. Just for everyone's benefit, design development. <laughs> there, there are currently provisions for a central plan. In the, if you look at the, yeah, the mechanical room is large. Yeah, there's a there's a boiler room, like a mechanical room near the near the kitchen, 
And then upstairs there are air handling units between the high space of the auditorium and the high space of the gym, and the high space of the auditorium and the high space of the cafeteria. Okay. And then this is probably it's a little further down the road, but uh, hold the microphone. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is probably a little further down the road, but have you contemplated what type of structure you're going to build for the uh, classroom wing? Is it steel? Is it masonry precast? And you know, how does that lend itself to floor finishes? Concrete floor, it's more looking, you know, basically getting at you know, long term, durable finishes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, right now, steel is is in flux in the, in the bidding market. Um, we've seen possibly increases of anywhere from 25 to 50 percent within the last year for certain structural shapes that are in demand. Uh, steel bidders are only putting their bids out for like 15 to 30 days. They won't carry them longer than that because they don't know what's going to happen with the tariffs. They don't know what's going to happen with the uh, trade wars. They don't know necessarily what's going to happen with oil if something would happen in Syria. So they don't want to leave their liability out there for a long period of time. So typically what we would come in and recommend is a steel structure with concrete uh, floors, concrete slabs on metal decks. But in an environment like this, where the steel is so expensive and volatile, we're probably going to look at the classroom wing as looking for possibly bearing wall construction. That again, that's the next stage when we get into design development and value engineering. We'll go through a process, and the school district will make those decisions at that time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hang on, Veronica. We have two other people raise their hands first. You haven't spoken yet. You know? Yes, sir, in the red shirt. Yes. Yeah. Hold the microphone. Hi, my name is Paul Culver. I'm actually here on behalf of my parents who have lived in, in Dresher at Audubon and Martin Lane since before either of these buildings were here. And uh, actually, since the very beginning, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but since the very beginning, they've been promised that the bus route would be changed and that the buses would not come through Audubon and Martin Lane. And actually, many times throughout the years, we're promised that that bus route would be changed, and it never happened. So, excuse my skepticism when I when I see if I believe it's doubtful that that's going to happen now. Uh, also, I'm, I'm glad you brought up about the utilities coming coming through Audubon. That, that's actually very interesting to me. And I, so I understand your challenges there, but um, I, I want to bring up what what Joe had said also about the loading dock being directly behind the homes now. Because anyone who lives along there, we, we can hear the truck empty the dumpsters on the loading dock all the way back behind the middle school cafeteria now. And now that's going to be directly behind the homes. So that, that doesn't sound like being a good neighbor to me. So those are the main points I, I want. I appreciate those comments. I wasn't aware of past promises on that. Uh, um, busing, but we'll uh, yeah, actually quite a, quite a number of times <laughs> come up in the past over the last 50 years. So I certainly I, I certainly understand your skepticism. Um, I don't know that there's anything we can say about those past promises, but um, and you know, so I understand if we say we're going to not do that. I was thinking you know, I'm actually going to trust you. Your intent, but yeah. it's, um, believe it when I see it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So thanks. Thanks for those comments, and we'll. We'll certainly do our best to minimize noise and uh, and other issues from the from the loading dock area. Thank you. Thanks. If I could just address that, when I say we want to be a good neighbor, the existing two schools basically have their main entrances facing the neighborhood right now. So that's where the concentration of all the traffic is. All the buses are the kids. You know, you get a lot of noise on that side of the building right now. The new, the, on the new project, we would be basically placing a almost a blank wall along that side of the project that faces the neighborhood with two exit doors in it that are required by code. They're not main entrances. We don't see a lot of people util utilizing those as entrances. So we really think we've cut down a lot of the vehicular traffic, a lot of the bus traffic, and a lot of the activity that would take place on the entrance side of the building by, by kind of putting the back of the building towards the neighborhood. We think we've improved 
the noise level back there, even with the loading dock, because we turned the loading dock and we're shielding it with, with walls to stop some of that sound from going in that direction. Okay, Brian. Any, anybody else want to speak? All right. It's just a quick question. Um, so as I'm listening and I'm sitting in this room, I'm imagining the, the demolition and the construction, and it got me thinking about the environmental impact also of just where all this stuff's going to go um, when you start, you know, taking it apart and the speakers and the lighting and. Is that somehow recyclable, or are there schools that might need it if you're not going to use it, or how does that all work? Or does it just get thrown into the dumpster because it's easier? Uh, so in terms of other schools needing it, I have seen districts prior to demolition go in and try to remove anything that they possibly can, and they store it for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and then they pay someone to get rid of it all. So unless you specifically have a specific place you can take it and put it and use it, whatever components they are, I don't typically recommend salvaging. Now, in terms of um, how the materials are taken, they are really um, recycled very heavily today. Um, so the landfill is not a good place for it to put it because it costs too much. So just by value, just by virtue of that, a lot of the materials will be recycled. All of the masonry, the steel components, all of that will be recycled. Um, even the ceilings and you know any products. Um, there's some products that won't be, but everything will basically be taken apart and recycled. It will be redirected uh, from landfill. So. That will be a high priority. I can tell you that buildings we've done recently, we've done a couple others that have been demolished and almost close to 85% was recycled. Okay. So a very high, heavy, heavy recycle. And even during construction itself, during new construction, most of the waste is recycled and uh, diverted away from landfills. Okay, that's so, but um, there will be some things that you'll want to salvage. There may be some door hardware specifically that Bob and his crew, there may be some valves and components. Um, you know, so there could be some things like that. But, um, you know, there's some things we've talked about even today. We were with Kim Small, who um, oversees the planetarium. And so there's some things we've talked about, whether the sound system there, because it's got some features that can be, maybe that could be reused, maybe some of the light components. But unless they're really, Expensive specific items. Uh, we don't recommend that we start working towards that goal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Swan. Hey, Bill Swan, medical inside. Uh, still looking over the plans. It looks like uh, there's been a lot of thought put into the things. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of balance. Uh, I'm glad to, to hear the. Uh, uh, a district's uh, commitment to the, the planetarium and so I have to lay out. One thing I, I just noticed uh, was that on a daily basis, one of the longest walks that um, any student's going to have to make is from uh, the furnace classrooms to the cafeteria. Uh, now, if that's a lot shorter than you know, the, the, the walks that they would have to do today, but other than that, you know, it's it's, it's a very nice, you know, I understand with the uh, housing utilities come in, so you have to have the uh, mechanical rooms and things like that where they are. Uh, it's nice that you have the auditorium nice and centrally uh, located, all the classrooms. Uh, yeah, I understand the one comment about, uh, uh, you know, natural lighting for the, the northwest facing classrooms, although Technically, they still get natural lightning. It just, they just don't get uh, direct sunlight blasting on them all, all day long. Uh, but that's, that's good for you know, reducing your air conditioning load and your heating load. Um, but the, the whole thing looks uh, you know, uh, really nice. You, uh, uh, a lot of uh, thought has is, is gone into it. And you know, there's, there's been some tweaks made the past couple months. Uh, uh, you know, okay, maybe you could put this over here instead of that. Uh, you know, a comment um, someone made earlier about uh, 
uh, even if you remove the planetarium and put in a tulip garden or something like that, you know, you don't change the overall square feet, so that's not going to change your cost. Um, and uh, the only other thing I noticed here is that there looks to be a, a, a stair coming down off Audubon uh, Drive down towards the cafeteria, which I don't know how that would be uh, there as well, wheelchair friendly. Um, but, you know, I'm not an architect, so I don't know whether those low lines indicate steps or not. Um, so, so it's not like I don't have any questions. It's just a, a few observations I you know, came across and wanted to throw out. On, on the observation of the longest walk from the bottom of the classroom wing over to the cafeteria, there was a, you know, we showed a, a draft of the plan that didn't have that angle part quite as long, which would have shortened the walk from the, from the furthest point. Um, but everything's a series of trade-offs, and so putting uh, all the grade-level class, core classrooms down there, and so other grades didn't need to invade that space, one out of the shortness of the walk in that case. But it's an overall actually not that long a walk, it just happens to be the longest one in this building. Um, does, can someone comment about the walkway from Audubon down to the cafeteria entrance? I'm not sure if I heard the question. This is the, the concrete walk. So I think the question was, and I don't, I'm not looking at it right now, if, if someone is walking from Audubon down to the cafeteria entrance, do they have to go down any stairs? The, there are stairs there. There's a, there's a great difference to bring people down. Um, they would be crossing the roadway that is the entrance to the loading dock. So we want to be very cognizant of how that's all done. So the idea would be to make it look like the sidewalk goes right through the McAdam driveway. And a truck might even want to have to roll up over the sidewalk to back in. We, we're, that's, those are details we haven't got to. But the idea is you make the sidewalk look like it was there first. It's the more important thoroughfare. Uh, since the cafeteria, <laughs> You're right, you, you need to hear my, uh, my comment. Uh, since the cafeteria is there, anyone coming off uh, the driveway from Audubon that needs a, a wheelchair or handicapped uh, access would have to go uh, into one of the other entrances and then to the, the cafeteria. Uh, but as was mentioned, uh, yeah, there's a little trade offs that you've got to make here and there. And, doesn't mean that they're utterly excluded from the, the, the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about the students who live in the neighborhood that would be in wheelchairs and they would essentially walk to school using their wheelchair? Uh, that's a possibility. That's not who uh, you know, I I just didn't know if that, if that yeah. happens. I wanted to know. No, that was just, uh, you know, was it just something that grabbed my eye? Well, in my experience, most children that will come to this building that are in wheelchairs will probably be dropped off by a bus yeah, near, near the other accessible yeah. entrance, yes, and we sure. certainly have that plan. Oh, sure. I also wanted to make a comment, too, if, it, if the longest walk in the building is from a classroom to the cafeteria, that's a good incentive to get kids to walk that length, because if you ever want to go to another space in the building, it's probably the cafeteria, right? Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. So our next uh, steps were, our goal, as, as we said, is to wrap up this phase of the process, uh, which is laying out the basic floor plan so that we can get into land development and design development, uh, hopefully by the end of, um, what, are we, what was that date? Where, where we want to wrap up this phase. So we are on May 17th. May 17th. Yeah, at the uh, operations committee meeting. So we certainly invite anyone to attend any board meeting or committee meeting. Next operations committee meeting is Thursday, October 17th. No, uh, May 17th. Sorry, there's one every month. Um, and, uh, and of course our legislative meetings, uh, when's our next legislative meeting, Brenda? And the next legislative meeting is May 14th. All right, thank you all for coming.